Let's take a look at some other stories that you sent in, beginning with this video showing a gridlock uh, on Otedola Bridge Expressway in Wardberger in Lagos State. Our outdoors reports that the gridlock comes after a car rammed into an electric, electrical pole carrying high-tension cables. Vehicles were stopped to prevent being electrocuted pending the arrival of the power holding company of Nigeria. He however reports that traffic started flowing after the cables were disconnected. Also from Lagos State is this next one uh, from Megbeda bus stop in Alimosho, local government area of the state, showing the bad state of that road. According to our eyewitness reporter, the poor state has caused a lot of damage to vehicles, so much so that many motorists prefer to travel with public transport. He wants the Lagos State government to look in their direction and help. Also similar to our final video from Ondo State showing this road, which, uh, according to our eyewitness reporter, connects Owo to Akumba and also connects the state to Abuja, the federal capital territory. Motorists are seen finding it difficult to use the road, which eyewitness says has become a death trap. He laments the traffic jam that now comes with using that road, saying that uh, it doesn't take more than 45 minutes, but now it's close to three hours just traveling between Akure, the state capital, and Akumba and he's appealing to the state and federal government to do something about it. I want to thank you for sending in those stories. Please note that you can send stories of your own. Just download the channel's television free app from the stores and also follow the instructions. Well, now joining me for more on the INEC submission deadlines and political parties' options is Senior Lecturer at the Political Science Department, University of Lagos, Dr. Daly Ashu. Thank you so much for joining us on the News at 10. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right, so let's quickly look at what indeed appears to be happening, um, talking about uh, the political parties. And, I mean, when we, when we um, look at what's happened, especially throwing from that report that we just saw, um, the chairman sending a final reminder to political parties yet to fulfill their end. I mean, what other options do they have? Well, I think the way to look at it is to say that, uh, that some parties are still unable to send in their nomination, and they need this kind of reminders from the chairman of INEC. It's a very sad commentary on our democratization process. This year makes it 19 years since we began this journey into democracy. And if you look at what's been happening in virtually all the political parties, it's been extremely difficult for them to agree on who you know, represents the political party in various elective positions in the coming election. What that tells us is that the politics of today is politics of the belly, politics of the pocket, politics of a patron client you know, relationship in which people only want to go into public office to feather their nest, their friends and cronies and that of their ethnic group. If we're looking at options available to these political parties, for example, what would you say? Well, I don't think that they really have options other than to beat the INEC deadline. Although maybe in future, there may be a window of opportunity for them to substitute candidates. But if you have political parties who are yet to hold primaries in some states, in Zamfara, for example, they've not been able to agree even the consensus um, candidates that they are putting forward, they can't seem to submit to INEC. And I also think that INEC will be doing a lot of good for this democratization process if they stood their ground. That once the window of opportunities are closed, any political party, and I say any, whether ruling or otherwise, who is not able to submit names of candidates should not be allowed to field anybody for the coming election. So you support that INEC should not extend the timing? I don't think they should, because to do so is also to be encouraging these kind of rat race primaries that we have witnessed in recent time. And INEC as an umpire 
So realize that whatever they do, beginning from now, will ultimately count during the forthcoming election. But, but let's look at the people. I mean, where does the people's will come in all of this to ensure that, you know, their will is not thwarted? Well, you see, unfortunately, the kind of, uh, the kind of politics that we play don't put the people at the core of politicking. If they do, these primaries will be less rancorous. In fact, will not be rancorous in any way. Even where you have parties calling for direct democracies, what you find is, is a, a kind of option amongst imposed or dictated candidates. So in all of this, the Nigerian people are not put into consideration. Finally, can the reduction in the number of political parties perhaps stop this crisis? Well, as a political scientist, I will not say that okay. you should reduce political parties because people should be allowed to freely, you know, associate. But INEC, as the election management authority, can set conditions which political parties must meet before they can advance to the next level in our political development. Right. So I think that that is what INEC should do rather than, you know, reducing number of political parties. Many thanks, Senior Lecturer at the Political Science Department, University of Lagos, Dr. Daly Ashiru, for coming on the News at 10. Thank you very much for inviting me. Elsewhere, the need for greater involvement of women in politics cannot be overemphasized. The questions have been raised on the low participation of women in the just concluded primary elections of political parties across the country. A group in Jigawa State have condemned the high fees political parties peg on the sale of nomination forms into elective offices, tagging it an open attempt to deny most women the chance to participate in the 2019 elections. Or elsewhere, another advocacy group insists that the fight against corruption can only be won when women are actively involved. A few weeks ago, women in Jigawa State gathered and marched to the State House of Assembly, demanding equal participation in political activities. As the primary elections approached, interested aspirants were expected to pay certain amounts of money to procure their nomination forms. Unfortunately, the steep cost of procuring the nomination forms of some political parties proved to be beyond the reach of most women. Two or three women indicated their interest to contest, when, but when it came to selling of the forms, the price became so exorbitant that you could not afford, even though they said we should pay half of what the men paid, but we could not. The only woman contesting for a political office in Jigawa State narrates how the high cost of nomination forms sent her out of the All Progressives Congress to contest under the platform of the Social Democratic Party. I had to change political parties because the money for the form is too expensive. Politics these days is all about money. We want to participate, but we cannot afford such huge costs. The women believe that if given a level playing ground, they would be in a better position to make a difference. We are mobilizing women, two different women groups, so as to equip them financially to stand on their feet and avoid this type of attitude of selling or buying of goods. And what better way to drive home the message on the need for gender parity in politics than this training organized by the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center for women from various groups in Oshun State. The center is in the forefront of the advocacy that the involvement of more women in governance and politics will boost the fight against corruption in Nigeria. The essence of it is to see how people can begin to hold the government accountable, particularly on corrupt, uh, corruption issues, is to support the general fight you know, against corruption that Nigeria as a country has actually uh, bought into, uh, is to see what role women can play to ensure that um, we become uh, people who are watching and people who are also blowing whistle when we see corrupt practices in hospitals, in uh, the educational institution and in other places. 
The dream is that someday women folk will enjoy the same opportunity in politics as their male counterparts and be afforded a better chance to contribute their own quota to national development. And youth in Bochi are pushing for a law in the State House of Assembly that seeks to provide opportunities for adequate inclusion and governance and also to promote youth development. They arrived at this decision to fund a bill before the House after a meeting of youth leaders and stakeholders organized by a non-governmental organization known as LITAT. <laughs> 7.3 million people live in Bauchi State as of 2017, and half of the population is youth. This is contained in a recent fact sheet released by the Health Policy Plus. The concern here is that if this youthful population remains unemployed, this will have an adverse impact on the socio-economic development of the state. Some of these youth have realized that the way forward is to take a bold step and shape the future by themselves. Here are representatives of various youth groups in Bochi on a brainstorming mission. They've identified a gap in governance that must be filled by the youth. From our survey, we discovered that um, there is virtually no young person below 35 years of age in the State House of Assembly. Neither is there any young person below 35 years of age in the state government's cabinet positions. This is marginalization in the highest order in the state where young people occupy more than 60% of the population. Issues of illiteracy, poverty and unemployment among youth are some of the challenges they say must be addressed immediately. Government needs to do more, and then we shouldn't uh, only leave it, you know, to the government alone. The CSOs. That is why the, you know, the role of the CSO is very crucial in this direction. They really needs to come on board to complement the effort of government towards ensuring that uh, where the government cannot reach out to the youth, the CSO, the CSOs can bridge that gap so that they can articulate the views of the, you know, and interests of the youth and interface with the government to see that uh, these interests and you know aspirations of the young people are adequately, you know, care, you know, included in the formulation of uh, policies and programs of government. Away from the national youth policy, locally state governments usually lack clear-cut policies for youth inclusion and participation in governance. The youth are asking the government and anticipating the proposition of a state law as the best option. The House of Assembly is ready to synergize with them. It's ready to promulgate laws for them. Let them have a definite template which they will want the government to implement as a law. But they have not yet done that. Now that I heard from them, they are trying to prepare a ground in such a way that uh, what has been discussed during this workshop, they are going to organize it in a form of a bill so that they will present it to the House of Assembly for onwards uh, submission to the executive for implementation. I will use this media to take it back as a challenge for the ministry to put in place more efforts to see to the development of youth programs in the states. The Not Too Young to Run law is a step towards securing the future of the youth in Nigeria, who believe enacting more youth-friendly laws will assist in securing the future of the youth as one of the greatest assets of the nation. When the news at 10 returns, Bile community in River State asks for help to nip potential crisis between it and neighboring communities over destruction of illegal bomb rigs, tools of trade. That's on our community report. Please join us again.